for you being with us uh, for this mini course throughout the month. And we're also very grateful for the number of organizations that have endorsed this series uh, and for the support of those of you who are joining us. Uh, we're really, again, grateful for, uh, for you being here. So as we've done every week, we're just gonna start with some of the uh, expectations and ground rules for this program. Uh, it is a webinar and we understand that that means that you are not able to see each other, but you know there are hundreds of you on this uh, uh, webinar watching live and then many that are able to catch it afterwards for those that have registered. So this series is intended for registered participants only. Uh, and by attending, you attest uh, to your identity as represented by your uh, display name. We ask that you do not record or take pictures on your personal devices or share the recordings outside of those who have registered. Uh, we have registration is still open. And if you register, we can send you uh, links for weeks that you might not have been able to join in person uh, or sorry, via Zoom uh, live. One of the main purposes of this, uh, of this mini course uh, is to hear directly from Palestinians uh, from Gaza. Uh, today, we're going to hear from two Palestinians from Gaza who currently uh, reside outside of Palestine. This is an opportunity to hear uh, voices that you might not otherwise hear. And so we ask you to be mindful of this uh, as we move through the session. If you do have questions for speakers, please use the Q&A function, which is the bottom uh, menu of your screen. And we do ask that you keep them to questions rather than uh, thoughts or comments. So again, we can maximize our time uh, with our speakers. And we do hope that you'll be able to join us uh, next week for the conclusion of this series on Gaza, where we will focus on the economics of Gaza. So soon we'll, we'll hear from our speakers, but first I wanna introduce our moderator for today, uh, Aziz Abu Sarah, who is the co-owner and CEO of uh, Mejdi Tours. He will be leading us through this session on politics of Gaza through the lens of our esteemed speakers, Jihad Abu Salim um, and Majad Abu Salama. Um, Aziz will introduce them and, and they will be able to introduce themselves just in a minute. Uh, Aziz uh, is an entrepreneur, speaker, peace builder, and author. He is a National Geographic Explorer and a TED Fellow. Uh, in 2009, Aziz uh, co-founded Mejdi Tours, which is a, a cultural explora exploration vehicle uh, for an ever-changing travel market. And I'm sure Aziz can share just how things have changed uh, even more so in the past two years. Uh, he's a seasoned tourism professional with over a decade of experience in the industry. Uh, and he's spoken at countless uh, international conferences and universities. And so uh, we're really grateful that he is with us here uh, today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now uh, for um, uh, the conversation. Thank you, Aziz. Yep. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate the, the introduction. And uh, I'm very excited for today because even I grew up in Jerusalem, I'm Palestinian. And even for us uh, who grew up in Palestine, different parts of Palestine, we have always limited access to Gaza. So the last time I was able legally to go to Gaza was when I was when I was a kid. Uh, since or when I was a teenager. Since then, it's become impossible to go there. And therefore, unfortunately, the information I get is similar to what many people get in the sense it's a through, uh, through the news, through people, but have not been able to go there. And so I'm excited about uh, this conversation because I look forward to hear what uh, Jihad and uh, Majid have to say. And uh, for us to dig deep and understand reality, understand the politics in Gaza, what, how it has changed in, in the last uh, few years. And uh, I'll just introduce our speakers. Jihad uh, Abu Salim is the Education and Policy Associate at the Palestine Activism Program at the AFSC in Chicago. He's a PhD candidate at the History and Hebrew and Judaic Studies joint program at New York University. And his research examines Arab intellectual writings on Zionism from the first half of the 20th century. Jihad also studied the social and political history of the Gaza Strip, focusing on the impact of the Nakba and the life of Palestinians 
Gaza district and 1950s political life in the Gaza Strip. And as well, he's he's grew up in Gaza, studied at Al Azhar University there, and, and writes for many publication. I can recognize at least uh, one because we've written for it apparently together, the 972, but you've done Al Jazeera, English, Palestine Square, Journal for Palestine Studies, and many others. So thank you for joining us, uh, Jihad. And then Majid. Majid, I, I became friends with Majid because of the reason I just mentioned earlier, not being able to go to mm -hmm. uh, to Gaza and I was working on filming for National Geographic a web series and realized we can't go on film and so it ended up being in the long run a good thing because I got connected to Majid who did an incredible incredible work helping us do all the filming we needed in Gaza telling the life of people in Gaza for that uh, web series which you can find online it's called Conflict Zone and on YouTube uh, Majid is a scholar, campaigner, human rights defender, and award-winning independent journalist who grew up. I like this part of your of your CV because you go into details. Majid, who grew up wearing blue clothes in Jalabia refugee in a, in a Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza, and is now based in Berlin. Um, he is. Uh, I'm gonna just pick some stuff because there's so much you've done. My friend, uh, he has been involved in organizing several national and local uh, campaigns and worked with several local and international organizations, including Students for Justice in Palestine and Norway, Beats for Gaza and Gaza, Coalition for Palestinian Rights, uh, and Against Racism in Germany. Uh, most recently, a Hebrew website, Border Gone, uh, which translates, we are not numbers stories. Majid is a member of the board of directors for We Are Not Numbers and is, uh, un, uh, is one of the uh, Humboldt, did I say it right, Majid? Humboldt, who are taking Israel to court in Berlin. His articles and political commentary have been featured in many websites, including Al Jazeera, Middle East Wise, Mando Wise, uh, Deutsch Well, and many others. So thank you both for being with us in this time. And I thought to start just telling us your part of the story. How was it like growing up in Gaza? And I know you're both not, not there now, but how was it uh, just growing up there? What was life like? Uh, Jihad, how about we start with you? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Aziz, for the invitation. Um, and I really appreciate that, you know, the opportunity to be part of this event uh, and to talk about Gaza today. So I, um, I was born in Morocco, actually, uh, to Palestinian parents who left uh, Gaza after the 1967 occupation. Um, and, you know, like they left to pursue studies, but also because life under occupation in Gaza was uh, becoming unbearable, and uh, and my family returned after the signing of the Oslo Accords in the mid '90s, uh, and this is where Gaza is where I grew up. My experiences were shaped by life in Gaza, so uh, it's where I went to school, uh, where I attended college, where I first worked in the civil society world, uh, in the world of youth initiatives, uh, and uh, and you know I did a lot of volunteering. Uh, and this is where, uh, and when I met Majid and uh, we, we worked together briefly there. Um, so, uh, you know, when I come from a small town in the middle of the Gaza Strip called Deir al Balah, uh, which, which is, you know, used to be before 1948, uh, a small agricultural village uh, famous for its uh, date palms and, uh, and a monastery, an ancient uh, Byzantine monastery, hence the name Deir al Balah Monastery of Date Palms. Uh, it's where I grew up. And, um, and you know, I was in, when, when my family returned to Gaza, we uh, built uh, our home on uh, land that my father inherited uh, from his, you know, from his father uh, that was located uh, next to uh, a settlement, uh, which was called Kfar Darum. And we moved into our new house in uh, right, like one month right before the second Intifada started. I was in fifth grade then. And um, this is basically, uh, you know, I, I think of my, 
uh, growth as a human being, the, the, the moment that shaped who I am was when we moved into our new home, we celebrated for three weeks, and then the second and the father starts living next to a settlement and spending the rest, the, the five years uh, after that um, until Israel unilaterally, unilaterally withdrew its soldiers from, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, repositioned its soldiers to be more accurate in Gaza um, in 2005. So, you know, I grew up next to a settlement, uh, hearing the sounds of bulldozers, uh, you know, seeing agricultural farms, vineyards and uh, orchards being destroyed, uh, you know, and white. Um, and, you know, th and this, this was just one chapter. Uh, as, as, a, as a young person in Gaza, your childhood, uh, and your growth is disrupted by, you know, the many events uh, that take place there. So um, after finishing high school, I became a student at Azhar University, where I did my undergraduate degree. Um, and in the midst of my studies, I witnessed the first large scale uh, attack, uh, aggression of 2008, 2009. Uh, but it wasn't just that. Life in Gaza wasn't just that. It was also um, a story of uh, trying to overcome all of these challenges and difficulties. And for me personally, uh, I, I responded to all these challenges and to, the, to those bleak moments that surrounded us most of the time by uh, an unhinged <laughs> love for learning. Um, and this is how you know I studied English, and I was part of a lot of uh, groups and uh, that did volunteering work uh, around issues related to youth empowerment, um, you know, access to justice, and things like that. Um, so yeah, and and then I uh, after I finished college, I worked a little bit in uh, in civil society organizations, and then um, I moved to the U.S. in 2013 pursue my graduate studies. Thank you, Jihad. How about you, Majid? Can you tell us uh, your story growing up in Gaza? Yeah, actually, I grew up But the uh, first. Aziz, thank you for you, for uh, all the organizations involved and the people who are listening that will take our stories back home to their families. And that is something we rely on because we can, maybe we can't uh, do anything with the satellite colonial regimes that as we are facing or with the blockade but what we can do is to narrate our stories to to you that maybe through you there a lot can be changed however my uh, i grew up from with a father who's a, a political uh, like leader in in the camp uh, Part of the PFLP, which is the Palestinian Liberation uh, Left, like the Palestinian Left uh, Party in Palestine, and he was one of those who are, I grew up in the first Intifada in Jabal refugee camp, and he was uh, a political leader. Therefore, uh, our house was very much under attack almost daily. You know, actually, all like all houses were like uh, raided uh, were, uh, by soldiers in the refugee camp, especially since Jabal refugee camp was very much under attack. And it's where the first intifada actually started from the refugee camps. Being a son of that father who has to go through a lot of imprisonments where, uh, funny enough, I always tell that uh, he just go out of jail and he make children, he go back to jail. So, so he made it actually three times like this, which, uh, but however, I did not feel at all that I had a father at the end of the day because I, my father has to has a huge responsibility as a community leader, as a political, uh, like a politician who's engaged with the left party. He has a responsibility toward the community and toward the first intifada, which is a very I mean, intifada that came out of like rebelling against the settler colonial regime, the situation of uh, at the end of 80s in Palestine. And also it's uh, a time where, uh, where to grow was uh, kind of accompanied by, uh, as a child even, you know, my first memories of, 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 that, of that time is while I was actually uh, running uh, home because my cousin was actually shot, you know, and he had, I, don't, I was not allowed to tell my parents that uh, I, my cousin was shot because by, the Israeli, by some Israeli snipers, because if I, 
if I tell them, then they would know that my cousin is shot and they would know uh, they would know that I was with him and I was not allowed to be with him. The second story always I like to tell is that when I were, we were going to kindergarten, uh, I was a little child who was uh, who's uh, with four uh, year old and my other older cousin who's five years old have to take us throughout the little uh, street of the refugee camp. And this guy, he was uh, a bit, little bit older as if he knows the way to the kindergarten because uh, he knows how to escape from the Israeli soldiers if they stop us in the middle of the refugee camps. So he will be the one who guide us, he go in front of us, and we will actually go as kids uh, on a kind of a, a military group, you know, where he will go in the front because he's the older with another cousin and will be under him and he will tell us, come after you. So that is a childhood. And then uh, for sure, the Intifada started. My father was in jail. I had three, I had two sisters at that time. Third, a fourth sister, uh, two sisters at that time. A fourth sister came and a brother. Uh, and we lived uh, a life in the refugee camp uh, for a while. Grew up as, uh, as you said, Aziz with the blue clothes, which I hate so much, because this is the blue clothes of the United Nations where we had to actually almost like a boarding school where we have, we just allowed to wear blue. So I, I actually was, uh, <laughs> after a while, I, I developed the trauma out of uh, this blue clothes because I actually very, yeah, it does, it is, it's strange, you know, when this is how you actually identify yourself as a refugee with, with a stateless uh, life and a stateless rights and a, a stateless uh, humanity, you know, they kind of, it feels like it's the blue clothes that dehumanize, dehumanize you and kind of humiliate you in certain perspective. However, uh, of course, you know, the, I grew up in those, you know, UN refugee, like schools, and then I went to high school where I started to be uh, kind of active in different organizations, and I met jihad at that time also after high school, and then we had the, the we had the first also, uh, me and Jihad almost the same age. I think we remember we were in university and I remember I also listened to Jihad before saying of the same time he was in university and the bombs start falling. That was of the actual biggest shock, you know, of our life, you know. But it, this was not actually the actual biggest shock on the bombardment of 2008, 2009, because I, in our refugee camps, as Jihad have said, we had so many invasions before. At the same year of 2008, we had an invasion where Israel have actually invaded our refugee camp and killed over 300 people. Uh, and that and this stayed in the refugee camp around it for about a month. And there are many invasions of areas like Deir el Bala, areas like Khan Yunis. This, you don't know it, but it's more many refugee camps and areas in town. But people re remember this harshness and, and uh, harshness of 2008, 2009 massacre and 2012 and 2014. And now the 2000, 2021, you know, so grew on, growing up there, uh, it was very active uh, politically, uh, socially with many different movements uh, in, the camp, in the camp, in, in, the, in the Gaza city and in the Gaza Strip, trying to uh, change as much in societies. Then we figured out that we, already also developed the hunger that after a while of trying to do as much as possible, uh, the blockade and Gaza became very small for your uh, mind, you know, so you feel like you would like to uh, grow a little bit more because you've done everything in your life that you can do. You worked, you finished school, you uh, had a good job, you met everybody, you fit political, so you need something a little bit more. So you grew up, uh, I went out as uh, him, as Jihad, I've done my master outside, and uh, then I've done, I'm doing my PhD right now in Finland uh, with, the, with the human geography. And this is uh, where I am also active outside for Palestinian rights and trying to achieve uh, more access to justice and uh, more Palestinian rights for uh, and, our and Both Shihad and Majid, just to be clear, majority of Palestinians in Gaza do not have that, that ability to leave Gaza. This is yeah. quite, hard to do already yeah i think we are one of me and jihad one of the most privileged i would say that to have uh, such possibilities to go out you know and uh, and we're very grateful for this you know we worked hard for it it didn't come as easy because uh, we had to apply a lot and you know the this kind of relationship between the global south and uh getting a visa to go out you know it's um, it's kind of a humiliating process and discriminatory structural violence that 
does take a lot of our uh, power and energy. The same, I would say, the same way that uh, the settler colonial apartheid Israel took so much of our life. So applying for visas, being rejected and being applying again and trying and hoping and hoping, it's uh, something we actually, as Gazans, like we uh, got used to hope so much and to rely on this hope. So and keep hoping and not breaking our hope. So, and that what does it break, right. what, what does make us not break our hope for liberation somehow. Yeah. Awesome. And I see some people sending questions and we'll look at those questions later, but I wanna start, Jihad, maybe you can, you can start with this. Um, 1993, 1994, Oslo signed, suddenly people think there might be a Palestinian mm -hmm. state, the Palestinian Authority comes to, two places specifically in uh, Palestine, which is Gaza and Jericho. And there is a political discourse. There was some hope that there'll be a political structure, uh, you know, laying the ground for a state. And so for people listening, what is, what was that structure? Or maybe we can start with what was it built on? What, what is the political map like in Gaza back in 93, 94, maybe even before and how it started transitioning with the presence of the Palestinian Authority, because suddenly you could do some political activism legally before that, I believe you couldn't. Uh, this is a great question, and I will try to answer it to the best of my ability, given the, the limited time we have. Um, but I, I would like to start with a small caveat before answering this question. And the caveat is that when we talk about politics in, uh, in Gaza, we're not talking about a uh, uh, Gaza as an exception within the broader Palestinian context. Uh, politics in Gaza, and I'm talking here about political factions, political groups, political movements, and the ideologies they sub subscribe to the worldviews they adopt and uh, the principles they embrace uh, and the, the, the spectrum of ideas and political affiliations and beliefs. Um, it's universal across the Palestinian uh, body politic, whether it's in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, inside Israel uh, and in the diaspora. So um, the, the groups and movements and parties that exist in Gaza today um, are not just unique to Gaza. They are groups and movements and parties, Palestinian, that Palestinians, not just in the Gaza Strip, but also in other parts of Palestine and in the diaspora and in exile, they subscribe to and follow. I say that because um, after the 2006 Legislative Council elections, um, a misconception was uh, spread by Israeli propaganda, uh, saying that, you know, indicating that it was Gaza that voted for Hamas in the 2006 elections. Um, and, and I think it's, it's disingenuous or either ignorant to adopt such narrative because the, the vote, the voting process, the elections took place both in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So, you know, we hear a lot this line, you know, people justifying the collective punishment uh, of Palestinians in Gaza by saying, oh, but Palestinians in Gaza voted for so and so. No, the Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem in 2006 voted for Hamas. We will get to this moment later, but I just wanted to begin with this caveat. Um, so the, the Palestinian political map for throughout most of the 20th century and into the 21st century uh, has always been a rich and diverse um, and complex political map. The Palestinian body politic is not, uh, you know, is not a, uh, uh, a binary just between, you know, Hamas uh, and, you know, and the Palestinian Authority led by Mahmoud Abbas, who's also the leader of Fatah, the Palestinian National Liberation uh, Movement, Fatah. Um, so before 1993, the, the reality was 
uh, as follows. Uh, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank uh, were subject to Israeli civil and military rule. And in 1993, Israel reaches an agreement with the Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, an entity that uh, for many Palestinians, it's the sole and legitimate representative um, as a structure that leads their national liberation. Uh, in the early 90s, the PLO was in exile, was based in Tunisia. Um, I'm sure some people are familiar with this trajectory. And the leadership of the PLO, led by Yasser Arafat, uh, reaches uh, an agreement with the Israelis to establish what we know today as the Palestinian Authority as part of the Oslo Accords. On the eve of that agreement, in the Gaza Strip, as in other parts of Palestine, um, there were groups that subscribed to um, an Islamist or slash Islamic worldview uh, inspired by the, the, you know, broader movement for political Islam, such as Hamas, uh, the Islamic Jihad, um, and other uh, smaller uh, militant and non-militant, uh, you know, like relig religion or relig faith-based uh, groups. Uh, some were interested in, in just preaching or social issues. Um, and of course, the, the traditional Palestinian left, the PFLP, the DFLP. Um, and in the center of this political spectrum, we have uh, groups such as Fatah, which has been and still is the dominant uh, group within the context of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which signed the Oslo Accords with Israel. Now, in 1993, um, the PLO signs the peace accords with Israel and the Palestinian Authority is established in the West Bank and Gaza as a vehicle to build state-like institutions in order to arrive and to achieve the Palestinian state that the Oslo Accords um, supposedly set in motion. Now, when the PLO returns from exile to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, it's faced with political groups and movements and parties that were not part of the, uh, that did not become by then and still are not part of the PLO. Uh, so they were excluded from that political structure which is supposed to represent all Palestinians and has the, the proper institutions to achieve such representation. Um, so the, the Oslo Accords, in short, um, I wanna be brief here, was a moment when a certain segment of the Palestinian body politic agreed to, to uh, enter a peace process with Israel without consultation with or the consent of other Palestinian political players that were not part of the PLO structure and haven't been allowed to enter the PLO structure. I hope this make, makes sense. And ever since 1993, we have the PA in charge, controlled mostly by Fatih, which is the dominant group within the PLO, uh, led by Mahmoud Abbas, who currently resides on top of three important positions. He's the head of the PLO, He's the head of Fatah, and he's the head of the Palestinian Authority. So he holds so much power. On the other hand, the opposition, there, there, is op there has been opposition to the peace trajectory, the peace process trajectory, and the establishment of the PA by forces from within the PLO, like the PFLP and, and uh, other individuals and, and groups. And there has been opposition by Palestinian forces and groups from outside the PLO, such as Hamas and the Islamic Jihad and, uh, and, and many other intellectuals and academics and Palestinian civil society leaders. So Majid, in, in 93, 94, and I, I remember, and maybe in the West Bank, my memory is different, but I don't remember Hamas being so popular. Definitely it was present, it had a strength, but it was not, as popular, it was not as strong in the streets as it ended up becoming with time, both I think in the West Bank and in Gaza, it became much stronger. What happened between 
1993, 94, and let's say 10 years later when it won, or 12 years later when it won the elections, mm -hmm. as, as you had mentioned, it wasn't only really Gaza, it was all across Palestinian areas where people decided to vote not for Fatah, not even for the left, but went to vote for Hamas. How did Hamas become more powerful, more popular among Palestinians? Yeah, that's a, um, a good question, Aziz. But it goes, uh, um, I, I like to add points when it's to pointing out how actually the bigger spectrum or the, the actually the main uh, representative of the Palestinians at the moment in Palestine, actually Hamas, you know, with a structure with uh, administrative structure and political structures, and they are very well organized, well structured, well, um, they know what they want. They have a very um, good establishment of foundation behind them. And that's what actually goes to answer your question, Aziz, is the fact that there is a, after Oslo, uh, many of the mistrust that the jihad have actually mentioned, the inclusion and exclusion of different people, and also the international society game, actually, which which exclude a lot of the work that has been done by other negotiators, such as the ones in Madrid, which has been actually representing representing a lot of the Palestinian from within, you know. But they've been neglected, and their voice has been away because it was not fit to the Israeli uh, narrative, you know. And also, maybe it would be it would be exclusive, ex it would exclude others within Palestine at that time. Such as even the PLO, because or Yasser Arafat in particular, you know. So that fear, that fear of feeling that maybe it will go out of hand, you know, it does. It did create some kind of uh, what jihad reached out to that the, the PLO felt the PLO represented by Fatah, I would say at that time only, you know, felt very and with a very stressful time at after the after the geopolitical change in all society after Russia and uh, has uh, the Soviet have collapsed and also many countries has been weakened and there has been disparate uh, from a country to a country, you know, they, they have lost, they, they felt that they have lost a lot and they don't want, they, they didn't, they couldn't be at the front line of fighting, uh, like uh, of, of fighting against uh, Israeli settler colonialism before they've been at the front line with Lebanon, with Jordan, but suddenly they start to become very far. All that together actually created what uh, what Jihad had mentioned, you know, and uh, that I do think this complement the ideas of where we are, uh, where where we are at Oslo right now. However, however, uh, this uh, created a huge exclusive, like a huge um, uh, like um, rejections by some people from within and. Uh, also some people not feeling inclu included within the different parties and those who are like my father, for example, who has been part of a, like leaders of the first Intifada and then he, and he was the leader of the PFLB during the first Intifada in my refugee camp, which is the largest refugee camp, he would feel somehow not, uh, not being, not engaged in finding, uh, not engaged in, 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 in in these resolutions and also not accepting and rejecting and refusing this because uh, because most people from uh, from Palestine have felt that they, this has been imposed on them, you know, from the outside, you know, I would say, I any mean, from those who has been engaged, either mainly the U.S. and Norway and a few who are uh, and Sweden, few are being engaged at that time because there was different talks in Stockholm at the same time there was different talks in um, in Oslo where just was where after Madrid's have been um, engaged. So this is all together have created where we are, um, where we are today. However, uh, Hamas came for sure when this comes, then a lot, uh, I would say some corruption started to come. Uh, people who has just been freedom fighters have not managed to reintegrate to the community, you know, have not been given a chance to actually rest, or have not been given the chance to act. To, to be trained to lead and to have an uh, how to how to actually have an authority actually the same mistake that hamas when they came into gaza you know they have not managed to add to uh, administrate you know build a structure of administration at the first place but they succeeded somehow after so fatih has have done the same uh, have lost their I main uh, arena some kind of trust uh, they try to put a lot the international community have, have given them lots of money to put uh, to actually buy the people, 
but they are thinking that by like putting a lots of new liberal uh, policies, which is based on opportunities like attitude would maybe actually uh, give some structure and institutional structure, as Jihad have said, you know, maybe we'll take people out of their uh, very uh, strong fights, you know, but the, 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 the days with it came, it, I would say this is accumulation. Year after year, people, uh, PA have lost in Oslo. They have not gained anything. They have not been giving, settle, set, settlers have been still increasing. Settlements have not been withdrawn, you know. Uh, lots of uh, problems have been happening with them economically. Uh, they have been signing really tricky things where other parties has been exposing them completely as being traitor to the dignity of the Palestinian people, you know? And so, can I rephrase maybe that? Are you saying in some ways the failure of Oslo or the failure of the peace process in some ways showed many people that this path is not working and has given strength to the alternative. And you mentioned earlier, the left has lost a lot of power with, with the USSR yeah. and all of that. Yeah, so I, I just, as he said, yeah, as you see, I do think to the everybody uh, listening, it's important to distinguish that also the international first well, first point I wanted to point out, which is the international community actually betraying the Palestinian inside Palestine and actually treating dealing with those who let's say some of them maybe have white masks, you know, they just talk the same tones that uh, the international community at that time want them to speak, you know. However, this kind of tone has not been the grassroots tone. The popular committee, which was actually responsible, which was responsible of most of the work at the after at the at the heart at the mid of the in the first intifada, has the big the largest point in the occupy like in the uh, in historical Palestine. So I am if the, looking at that place that have been rejected and then let's say uh, asking me and Jihad to solve the problem of Palestine Israel right now while we are just outside without consulting people from within. This is hypocritic was for everybody in and that has been like bringing leaders to people that they don't want to without just agreeing with Fatah without because they want the social democrat at that time league in Europe have actually find out that two-state solution and Fatah needs to be empowered because it's part of the social democrat narrative would actually uh, like uh, lift their ego, you know, and bring them kind of, uh, make them a bigger leader, you know, like a, a player, a third mediators, you know, in that, in our, in the, the, the one of the most central uh, struggle for liberations and conflicts in the world, which is Palestine. Well, they, this is, this is, this is why they play a game to put people in different actors. So that, that is, so that created a clash in that point because you're talking about Fatah and I, their yeah, vision. I would say local agency is very important. You know, until now, everything if does it, if it does come from top down, it wouldn't work. If it comes from bottom up, it does work. You know, and that is where we actually understood throughout all the studies until now. Things has to come throughout the people, the grassroots group the people in the refugee camps. If it didn't come, let's say Palestine, if it didn't come from refugees who are asked all the struggle of liberation is about refugees. This is the main stone. And if you wanna make a, a, make a resolution without talking about right of return, you know, this is way beyond, you know. Can we, can we remind people- to the Palestinians. And can we remind people come, how many refugees live in Gaza? Yeah, to remind us, for example, in Gaza, which was the central struggle uh, against uh, settler colonial regime in, in the first uh, uh, in the first uh, intifada and the second intifada, there is 80, about 70 to 80 persons of the of the Gaza Strip are refugees. You know, so I am. We don't have a clear, but I think about 70, right? You have about 70. So we yeah, talk about I mean, 1.3 yeah, million. Exactly, but everyone those are. But this, those were, those was the most people who engaged with the vulnerability and the precarious life they lived in. So they have all the intergenerational trauma of the settler colonial regime. They are the ones who actually would fight all the time because most of refugees came to Gaza or left to Lebanon or left to Syria. The most concentrated refugees and the most refugees that come from all over Palestine concentrated as, as a a uh, multi um, village culture, or whatever, like inside Palestine, they are concentrated in Gaza. And if you don't actually find uh, find uh, and talk about their main dignified right, which is right of return, then you are actually betraying 
your own people. And that is what the what is what Fatah at that time have been saying, but since they have not talking about it in the Oslo and have actually went further with not having a full structure and, and uh, then Hamas comes speaking out, still keeping the resistance against settler colonial regimes, for sure they have gained more powers, they have gained more pricing, you know, different, uh, the, more, the, the more you resist the settler colonial regime, the more you get praised because this is the resistance what bring dignity to the people of Palestine. Imagine. And that is Let also me... with all, let's say just for a second, Aziz, it's with, with all the geopolitical analysis, I would say, which is the Soviet, the BFLB coming down, you know, and also the change of all power dynamic within the Middle East way until Afghanistan to Iraq to Soviet to the US and who's who's the most interested in the Jeep to empower at the most uh, at that exact time. All right. So let, let me then move to Jihad. I, I have something I'll come back to you on, but let's get get Jihad back in. So all of this I think makes sense in, in the sense that Fatah makes a deal. The deal doesn't give Palestinians a feeling that they're making really any progress. Hamas comes in and says, look how corrupt everybody else. They win the elections in um, about, what was it now, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, 2006. International community like Jihad, like uh, Majid say, rejects Hamas and says, we're not going to deal with you. Israel says, well, if you're not accepting two-state solution, we're not going to deal with you, which is kind of amazing considering the current Israeli government rejects the two-state solution openly. Uh, but despite that, we're not going to work with you. And it doesn't end there. That creates a major crisis now in between the Palestinian society. And a year later, we have a mini, almost like a civil war was going to start in Gaza. Can you talk us through, and I think many, many people here, especially in, in the U.S., don't really know what mm -hmm. happened in this 2007 when Hamas and Fatah mm -hmm. had a major clash and ended up, you know, Hamas ended up taking over Gaza. And then Fatah take over the West Bank and we have a division among ourselves. Yeah, this was definitely a traumatizing time for for Palestinians in general and for Palestinians in Gaza in particular because um, the international community's reaction to Hamas winning the elections was to um, uh, condition admitting Hamas into uh, the uh, the club of uh, you know uh, forces or or parties with from within Palestine that are accepted by the international community um, did not work and uh, the the approach uh, you know was to uh, uh, create conditions. Uh, that required Hamas to uh, recognize Israel's right to exist and recognize the previous agreements signed between the Palestinian Authority uh, or the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Israel and, um, and you know, totally uh, abandon um, the resorting to armed means uh, and dismantling and disarming the, their military wing and so on and so forth. Um, and, and like the peace process happened in a, in a top-down uh, format, as Majid mentioned earlier, during throughout the 90s, uh, so was the international community's reaction to Hamas winning uh, the majority of the seats of the Palestinian Legislative Council slash parliament in 2006. So um, instead of engaging in a process to uh, address the differences between the different Palestinian political parties and instead of, um, uh, uh, you know, ask, instead of the international community asking serious and honest and 
and brave questions about why did the Palestinian population in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza make such electoral choice? The response was uh, the use of violence, more isolation of Palestinians, uh, cutting aid and, um, and collective punishment. And in that context, um, and this has been documented by uh, US media um, and by many academics and scholars who study the region and study um, the history of that moment. Um, the, the US and Israel and certain uh, players in the region and in the international community reacted to Hamas winning the elections by um, escalating um, uh, the arming and uh, support to certain uh, Palestinian security forces within the Gaza Strip that, um, uh, that refused to, um, uh, you know, so Hamas won, they formed the government, the first government was actually a national unity government. And, you know, once a political party wins an election, there is supposed to be a transfer of power, right? And then this political party uh, is supposed to implement their agenda based on the, their electoral platform. So when the, the national unity government, which included Hamas after Hamas won the elections, tried to implement its agendas and you know, to expect a complete transfer of power within the institutions of the Palestinian Authority, uh, that did not happen because uh, some of the security forces that were established as part of uh, the Oslo process um, did refuse to cooperate with the incoming, uh, you know, newly elected uh, Hamas uh, cabinet. Uh, and this was a problem. And, you know, some people also criticized Hamas for running in an elections within the framework of the Oslo Accords, um, while, you know, raising the slogans of resistance and standing up to the Israeli enemy and people and a lot of Palestinians questioned that choice on the part of Hamas and they asked Hamas, why did you do that if you are opposed if you are fundamentally opposed to the Palestinian Authority as a byproduct of the Oslo Accords, then why join, why enter an electoral process within the context of these institutions? Um, but again, like regardless of why Hamas did that, they ended up, I mean, they represent a segment of the Palestinian population, they ended up running, they won. Um, and you know, the, the international reaction. I mean, we heard the leaks of, uh, you know, former uh, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, talking about how, you know, the, the international community shouldn't have supported the elections to begin with if they knew that this was the result. And some people say that Hamas itself did not know or they, they weren't sure that they would win the majority. They were looking for a strong opposition within the parliament. But anyway, again, like the international reaction was not one where, uh, you know, you respect the results of the elections or uh, the reaction was let's discipline Palestinians and teach them a lesson and not ever voting for what the international community deems the wrong, uh, you know, political party to choose in a, in a democratic elections, which goes against the spirit of democracy. So, you know, more money, there was money uh, coming into the Gaza Strip, uh, being funneled to uh, armed groups that were challenging the authority of the newly elected government and uh, around issues of security and policing. Uh, Hamas formed new security forces that clashed with the, uh, you know, Fatah-based security forces that refused to collaborate or cooperate with the newly elected government and refused to uh, recognize the mandate of the newly elected government. So small skirmishes started to take place on street corners in, you know, uh, at intersections between different uh, armed uh, armed men from both groups. And this devolved into large scale confrontations. I mean, I was doing my uh, high school diploma at the time. And I remember, 
you know, I was studying for the Tawjihi, the general secondary education certificate, which is, you know, the culmination of your 12 years at school. And I was studying for those exams as I was hearing Palestinians shooting at other Palestinians on the street with, uh, with arms and, and supplies that came from the outside. Um, and then uh, eventually the security forces backed by the PA and Fatah crumbled in the face of um, uh, the disciplined uh, Hamas uh, forces and Hamas took over the Gaza Strip uh, militarily. It's one of the actually like funny things I, I recall. Um, I went to the first exam of my uh, high school diploma, you know, they're held in the summer and June. Um, so I attended the first exam and the, the armed, the policemen uh, outside the school where the exams were administered uh, in, the in the first exam did not have a beard. And, uh, and he would say marhaba, which is like, you know, a much more secular way of saying hello. And then a few days later, Hamas takes over and I go back to the, to the exams and the, and the policeman who was at the door had a beard and he, was, and he, and he said, Assalamu alaikum. So, you know, it, it, it was a, 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 a fundamental bloody change, um, mostly that happened mostly due to how the international community approaches Palestinians and to the violence uh, that, that is inherent in how the international community treats Palestinian politics. Uh, so f f whether it was, yeah. How did that change life? Like you mentioned now the, this one person, but uh, your, your guard in, in the school who says Salaamu Alaikum instead of Marhaba, much more religious. How much Hamas did go into that direction of Islamizing kind of way of life in, in Gaza? And was there a resistance to that? The answer is yes and no. Uh, at the end of the day, Hamas is part of, you know, the, like I said, a complex and rich and diverse mosaic of Palestinian, uh, Palestinian society with composed of Muslims and Christians and secularists and nationalists and liberals and leftists and atheists and believers and you know you, you have the whole the whole package right um so uh yes there were attempts on the part of the of hamas to impose certain socially conservative values and people you know some people uh, adopted that others resisted uh, and people you know uh refused to um to uh, you know, accept certain practices, and there were there was resistance to them, uh, and this is normal. You know, this is part of uh, of life in any society. Now, the problem, the actual, like the real issue, was that after Hamas took over the Gaza Strip and uh, and concluded its, its clash with the Palestinian Authority and expelled the Palestinian Authority, or you know, uh, from from the Gaza Strip. Th that was a painful moment in terms of how Palestinian society has been fragmented across historic Palestine um, and, and how those, uh, those top-down policies and approaches that the international community adopts to uh, approaching Palestinians, how it, it, it created this, these deep divisions. So, for example, I'll give you a few examples. When Hamas took over uh, the, the Gaza Strip, Israel announced uh, the Gaza Strip as a hostile territory. This resulted in the closure of, uh, of crossings and you know, prevention of import and export. And, um, and that was a painful chapter in the economic collective punishment and blockade of the Gaza Strip. Uh, Palestinians uh, in Gaza, you know, like they, they became unable to travel like, like never before, you know, they, they you know, they became trapped. Um, you know, I myself, I finished high school and then I wanted to, to, to study abroad. And I had to wait for a year and a half for the crossing to open, just to go, uh, you know, just to leave Gaza and go to attend my school. And I couldn't leave. I still had ended up doing my undergraduate education in Gaza. Um, the Palestinian Authority based in Ramallah now, ordered, uh, ordered tens of thousands of public servants to abandon their position and never go back to work. Uh, so that because they were concerned that if these public servants uh, joined the Hamas government, then 
um, then uh, the international community would continue its sanctions against the PA. So what happened is you have tens of thousands of public servants, teachers, doctors, uh, you know, uh, bureaucrats in all the ministries. They had to sit at home since 2007 and not go to work. And if any of them goes to work and work under the Hamas bureaucracy, their salaries paid by the Ramallah-based authority would, would be cut. So Hamas had to replace tens of thousands of public servants with a, a new body of uh, a bureaucracy, 50,000 employees who are now, you know, like managing the affairs of the Gaza Strip and being paid, you know, on a regular basis, you know, receiving uh, small checks here and there. So, you know, and this has been one of the major issues of the current division between Hamas and Fatah, the question of the public servant employees who, uh, who, are, who Hamas created as an alternative bureaucracy after 2007. And, um, and the PA in Ramallah still refuses to incorporate in its bureaucracy because of international community pressures. Right. Uh, Majid, uh, so Hamas takes over and now it's a new government. Has really anything though changed other than every once in a while there's a big fight with Israel, but has anything really changed in Gaza, in way of life, in bureaucracy, in, I don't know, like I remember Fatah used to, or the Palestinian Authority used to every once in a while do the rounds, arrest anybody who's opposed to them, still does that in the West Bank. And I hear the same thing is happening in Gaza, where it's becoming more and more happening both in the West Bank and Gaza. If you're not, if you speak, if you speak against us, we not gonna let you. So that mosaic, Jihad, you've been talking about, is it getting harder with both the Palestinian Authority and Hamas where kind of opposition is not anymore? There's a one man rule in each of those. There's no elections. There's no way to really, you can have whatever political party, PFL, PFLP, for example, your dad, Majid, but you have no way of getting into power. There's only one government in Gaza. There's only one government in Ramallah and neither of them wants to give up power. Uh, I just want to mention, it's very important to understand that this, uh, like I would say, very neoliberal practices of the West, which actually make the people with the, who are under neoliberal uh, policies uh, in debt, keep being making them in debt, you know, giving them in need to their support, making them imprisoned and blockaded by the support of the West, you know. This is what B, the BA have actually, um, and the social, I, would, I also mentioned the social democrats worldwide has been actually uh, sustaining, you know, this dependency that is, uh, that Fatah is uh, kind of becoming a subcontractor of the West and a subcontractor of Israel, meanwhile. And that is actually clear also in the fact, uh, allow me to say that also in the fact, when you look at the budget of the BA, the Palestinian Authority, you will see the highest budget of the of the uh, the highest budget is goes into security, and this security is actually to sustain I don't know over 120 30 thousand soldiers just to actually go around make sure that the the very pontus stands that Palestinian lives in in Jerusalem and the small towns around here were surrounded by settlements are well secured so the settler can move in you know in and out of different places. So this kind of... But is that kind, different than Gaza? Is that different than Hamas, you think? No, but I, I'm, this is one, one very important thing just to say, but then coming back to Hamas, you know, then you actually have, this is a part which is subcontractor of the Israel, which is the biggest face that, Hamas, that, 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 that West won, because West, as Jihad mentioned, they had what I call it's like extreme denial and extreme refusal of talking to Hamas and accepting them and accepting any uh, parties which has any anything to do with Islam and religion and Islam and politics and they don't want to realize like they would accept a Christian demo <laughs> and I do see Hamas actually as a, a Christian democrat here. The Christian democrat, the Islamic democrat in Gaza and in Palestine is Hamas. I am as a secular person, jihad also, I believe the same. We are, we don't like their politics much, you know, we fight against them. We There is many rebelling aspects. I was part of many 
of those which act one of those and also part of many uh, movements which actually try to not rebel against Hamas uh, in, in, in a certain way, but also to mainly it is to, uh, because they, the West is taking it as rebelling and Hamas, we always actually emphasize that it is for the unity. It's the, for the Fatih and Hamas to come and talk to uh, together and leave the West away from our uh, own house, you know? And that's where Hamas actually still felt that those uh, like few revolution, uh, revolutions here and there within the Gaza Strip, you know, in different time, is actually it's a secular uh, revolution that comes from the outside. And, and if you refu come from the outside, and those might be foreign agents. I myself, for example, was called the foreign agents because it's no like they has this time. If you have, if you've been rejected and refused all this time, how you would trust? You know, so I understand Hamas, you know, if you have been actually been taken down as part of Muslim Brotherhood, which they claim not, they claim not. But if you've been uh, taking out in Egypt, taking out in many different countries just because of your religious views, you know, then this is you know, the freedom of religion or the freedom of uh, like you have to be secular so you can fit to the West. You know, you have to wear like, you know, and that kind of being in, the, in such a trap as people from that party, actually, it's very stressful and traumatizing for them. You know, I've been close working, fighting with them, fighting, fighting with me because in the social structure, as every other country, you disagree that the Republican and the Democrat will disagree on social structure and social codes. You know, and we yes, also will but, disagree. But Najed, you don't, you don't have any avenues to disagree. Meaning, I have friends in Gaza who, when they disagree, get beat up. They get arrested. They get put in jail. They not. You don't. You know. I can go outside, and yeah, the U.S. is getting more extreme. But I can go outside and say I disagree with Joe Biden. I think he's an idiot for what he's doing. I'm not gonna. Most likely, not gonna get arrested, right? But yeah. in Gaza, things are not that simple. And in the West Bank too. I mean, and no, 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 both of them. Both of them are imprisoning activists. They're both of them are silencing journalists. You know, because both of them are insecure. This insecurity that they have been both in, you know, have actually put, put them at the center, put this actually topic at the center. I am like, I'm not far from this. I have been imprisoned and kidnapped and like and many times. You had I remember, time was and I remember the questions they asked you, which were crazy. I yeah, exactly. The I have been there, but this is actually, for me, I feel it, this is very internal. I can explain to, uh, like, this is, I do think this is a struggle that comes with a lot. I was, I'm one of those who talk the freedom, uh, uh, of the Freedom of Expression Award in Gaza because I wrote something, I wrote an article about the, uh, the unity and the division between Hamas and Fatah. Okay, so I've been active, very active politically, I guess, and I know both directions, but I am myself very, very much important for us and for, for me personally and for the audience to understand that this is trouble that comes out of the, the outside, which is we have a duty to change from the inside, but the outside is that having been under blockade living in a ghetto for over 15 years, you know, has not been accepted that time. Have I actually have a lot of empathy with Hamas, you know, having been rejected to that position, you know, like from 2006 to having to surrender and compromise, even in the going as a jihad, say under Oslo, you know, to actually being beaten up so they can be part, they can fit in, you know, which we did not agree, you know. This is all the main, this is for me the main topic. Excluding you know? someone doesn't help make them come to the table. It never yeah, works. Exactly. It never because, works. because I also, Aziz is very important for us as Palestinians. To understand. I don't want to take the topic toward, oh yeah, we are oppressed by our own people, you know? And I don't, I don't think this is, uh, this is reality. We actually fighting it, you know? But we actually have to understand what our own people and our own uh, leaders are, their character is, you know, we see the history of Hamas. And we see the history of Fatih. We see who they rely on, how the, the West have treated them and how internally things are going with them. 
And we see the amount of pressure that the both governments have been doing. And they both actually, at this moment, they kind of portray, like the people, if you ask the bottom, uh, the bottom people in the street, they both disagree with both of them. And each one of them are like the West Bank, like the people in Gaza more, because the people of Gaza like to resist, you know? And we are showing this kind of a, a dignified, let's say, a resistance confrontation of Israel. And, and as, but it comes, and if you want to win the people of Palestine, you have to fight, you have to kind of try your best to dismantle the settler colonial regime and the apartheid that is there. However, in the internally, so, I am very much for, yeah, still keeping this. Let, track me, let me continue on this. Having the intersection. Let me continue on this. And this is a question, I'll start getting questions from people. This is a question that multiple people here have asked. And they say, you keep saying you want Israel to talk to Hamas, you want the international community to talk to Hamas, but doesn't Hamas want to destroy Israel and therefore kill you know, all the Jews there? How do you want them to talk to somebody who wants to kill them? Is that possible? How would you respond to that? In its charter, Hamas is, for destruct, destroying Israel. So how would you respond to people who say, well, Israel, Hamas doesn't want peace really, it just wants to kill everybody on the other side. That's what, and I'll tell you, I, even when I talk to people who, um, who are much more in the moderate side, this is what they hear, is that Hamas is sworn to kill pretty much every Israeli, every Jew, they're not really willing to live together, they're not gonna accept two states, or in reality, if they accept one state, it's gonna be, a very Islamist state, which nobody would want to live under if they are Jewish or Israeli. So where is where is the, is that accurate? Let's start with that. Or is this a misreading that people have on Hamas? Because I remember hearing Mash'al saying that he's okay with two-state solution a couple of times. Um, is that, wh what's your reading on that? Either of you can take it. I can say a few things. I mean, uh, some of these questions have a lot of hypotheticals that are not rooted in reality uh, or in the in the real or actual balance of power. Um, so, you know, my role here today is not to justify for any party or justifies position. I, I don't speak for any Palestinian political party. I, my role here today is to provide a nuanced understanding of the reality on the ground. And um, if we are going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, intentions and, uh, and you know, uh, Palestinians making or, or making the right choices from the standpoint of Israel and the international community, then let's talk about the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, led by President Mahmoud Abbas and, um, and, his, uh, and this, the enterprise that uh, he built with support from Israel, the European Union, the United States. Um, since Abbas consolidated power in the West Bank in 2007, um, the security, the entire security apparatus, the security forces have been, has been restructured to do their job well. And their job is to um, police Palestinians, limit Palestinian uh, reaction to uh, Israeli uh, practices, um, and basically destroy any infrastructure for Palestinian armed struggle in the West Bank and arrest people with links to any groups that Israel and its allies, including the PA, deem dangerous or, uh, or unwelcome. The Palestinian Authority led by Abbas spreads a message of peace that, uh, you know, that they go out of their way to talk about how much they want to uh, you know, live in, with Israel side by side. They change things in the Palestinian curriculum. Palestinian Mahmoud Abbas himself, uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas himself, he, uh, you know, he uh, gave up his right of return and said that you know, the right of return uh, should not be uh, 
a thing anymore and that he would be go, he would go back to the city where he was born and his parents came from suffered as a tourist and the palestinian authority in the west bank uh, welcomes israel delegations on a regular basis and so on and so forth what did the palestinian authority get in return more settlements are being built more palestinian land is being seized more checkpoints are being built and expanded. Palestinian, how, how did these practices of the Palestinian Authority and actions improve the situation of Palestinians on the ground in the West Bank? So if we are talking about creating a model for when Palestinians adopt these approaches, then, then Palestinians have the right to question what is happening in the West Bank as this model, because you know, like now we're, we're, we're told, look at the West Bank. The West Bank is thriving, but it is not. People there are living under, you know, people can't travel from one city to another uh, unless they pass through checkpoints. Palestinians who live in Ramallah and need to apply for a U.S. visa at the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, which is just 20 minute, you know, like car ride from where they live. They have to apply for permits and wait for months. And most likely they won't be able to do that. So I think it's disingenuous to, um, to uh, present, you know, Palestinians with, uh, with these litmus tests, right? And to tell them, if you do so and so, you will be rewarded with so and so. We have, we have you know, I, I went to a meeting uh, two years ago. Uh, where a Palestinian official led with, you know, he met with a group of US uh, officials and community leaders. And, and the guy said in that meeting that uh, there are 60, 65,000 members of the security forces in the West Bank who are not there to protect me or my children, they're there to protect Israelis. And they have been doing this job so well to the extent that it's been, you know, like Palestinians have so much disdain for this model. But what did they get in return? Nothing even symbolic. So I think it's disingenuous to, uh, to keep telling Palestinians that, you know, they have to, uh, uh, you know, adopt certain approaches because the ones who are adopting this approach, the ones who are walking the walk of the peace process are not, are not getting anything. And, and as of recently, um, you know, they they haven't been even getting uh, the the you know the 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 empty words like even the empty words and the, you know the Israelis are not saying them anymore about the possibility of a two states. You know, we've had multiple Israeli administrations that de that reject the two state solution publicly and deny Palestinians' right to establish a state of their own and exercise their self determination. So, you know, you know, we see, we see political groups in Israel that run for elections that in their platform, uh, you know, their electoral platforms and, and the charters of their uh, political parties declare uh, that, you know, Judea and Samaria uh, and even, you know, uh, the Golan Heights, like these are all lands to belong to Israel. So what about, what about erasing the rights of people, who, the Syrians who live in the Golan Heights, and uh, which was occupied from a sovereign nation. What about Palestinians in the West Bank whose right for you know self determination is being denied by those political parties? The international community does not impose sanctions on all Israelis and say, okay, let's close up Israel and limit exports and imports and destroy businesses and go after people's livelihoods. I think I think it's disingenuous and dehumanizing to uh, to normalize the collective punishment of millions of people just because um, you know they uh, a certain political party comes to power with a certain agenda. And as for the charter, I mean the charter has been changed, and I know I, I don't represent Hamas here, and I, I don't speak for them, and it's not my job to do so. Um, but you know. Uh, Anyone can do a small research. There are a group of uh, books that has been written on the subject recently, especially by Tariq Bakouni, who wrote a book about, uh, about Hamas and its political evolution. And finally, let's remember that Hamas was founded in 1987 
you know, and what was the context in which it was founded and, and what, what was life for Palestinians like that produced that uh, Hamas as a, as a political phenomenon. Um, so I, I, I encourage people in the audience and I, and I know that most of the questions are not coming necessarily from, you know, the, from bad faith, but I really encourage people to delve deeply into the complexities of Palestinian politics because only by doing so, you will be able to understand the different nuances and the different uh, uh, ways we can, we can really make sense of, of these things. And at the same time, let's remember, there are people on the ground who are paying the price of these policies. We have families in Gaza, Majid and I, we have parents, we have siblings, we have people who we love and care about, friends who have been who are sick and tired of paying the price of an election that took place in 2006, and they are still being punished for it. In the meantime, Israelis can run you know, for, for elections uh, and coalitions can be formed, even with groups that embrace the most you know, ridiculously racist uh, platforms. And nobody says a word about that. So I guess, you know, I guess we need to question the approach and this isn't necessarily uh, a call for, uh, you know, um, for, I don't, I'm not saying that it's all in the hands of the international community, but the international community definitely plays a role in, in, in creating a framework for how politics happen and, and how we approach those politics and what are the consequences of them. Right. So I, I'll get another question here and I have, there are so many and we're not going to get through most of them, we'll have to do this again to, to go through so many questions about Gaza. And I think partially, that's why there's a four part series, partially is just people don't know much about Gaza. We hear about all these statements and talking points on TV and, uh, and it's important to verify what they are. And that's, I think, why these questions are coming is trying to say, here's what I heard. Tell me, what, what do you think about that? So here's another one uh, of those. We talked about the PA being funded by the West, but also Hamas gets funded from outside. Um, Qatar is an example of funding, helping other areas as well. So does that affect the agenda of Hamas? Is that good or bad? And then Israel itself is involved in that. Every penny that comes in to Hamas goes it through. Israel and there is the, the thought or the idea, many Palestinians I remember hearing saying it, but also few of the people here asking questions of that. Israel wanted Hamas in the beginning to be created because that weakens other political Palestinian groups back in the 80s, that uh, when especially when the Intifada was started. So does Israel, does Israel have a policy of maybe keeping Hamas or keeping the separation is good for Israel, keeping Hamas somewhat strong is good for Israel. And what about the funding that comes whether through Israel or through other countries as well that will affect Hamas policies? Uh, it, thank you, Aziz, for the question. I just, uh, of course, you know, I think like any parties in different places, uh, Hamas gets funding from different places, but I, I see, I see in the question, actually, many people are just asking about Hamas. And I do think this comes out of all, you know, the waves, like especially the 19th century's wave of anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia and the, the connection between the far right, uh, like, and uh, the right wing, like governments uh, and extremist governments who are trying to just uh, uh, portray like Muslims as being the, as as be, like as as being mon monsters, you know, as being those people who you cannot collaborate with. How they they don't see them? They are invisible. They should be invisible, and that is where I see that lots of they think of, of all the our struggle as that's uh, it is Hamas, you know. And I do want to uh, clarify that very important, like jihad, what jihad have said. There is to discuss Hamas for us is like we can, uh, and or to discuss Palestine. Politics, it's uh, give me 74 years, I can discuss it for you, it's fine. You know, so we can explain it, you know, or we can, if we want to discuss like Hamas, it's a long road. So please don't simplify when you, when, when asking question, the aspect that this is, uh, we have a very intense everyday life. We have a very intense radical transitions and we have a very uh, like, um, 
uh, those are our families, Hamas, our, our families, Fatih has our families as jihad. We're not uh, said, we're not speaking on behalf of anybody, but we actually respect uh, each one's opinions and we believe that it's very important that uh, to uh, to uh, to actually also trust them and somehow sometimes disagree with them and agree with them and try to accommodate them so we can actually liberate our people. But however, back to your question, Aziz, is important to uh, it's uh, it's important to say that uh, yeah, Qatar is very close. It's um, they, they are supporting different groups that is uh, it's all regional and uh, geopolitical interest and intervention but Hamas has been conditions you know that when people say is Hamas is in, like talks to Israel of course there are many actually uh, now, uh, there are many different reports speaking as uh, sneaking that as Hamas is talking to Israel you saw in Gilad Shalit kidnapping you know that there was uh, secret agents and there are people who have been involved you know so it is, yeah, I do think Hamas is, it doesn't, the, Hamas talks to Israel, they talk through Qatar. Qatar is a very mod, uh, the mediator between them and Israel. They had a lots of pressures to actually keep uh, people alive, you know, and the, also I would say also sustaining their power because they don't want to, I mean, their ego will be very hurt if they actually give up everything they built and give up all the struggle. That, they have been going through to actually uh, survive this blockade, you know, which is not as easy as anybody could think. This is living in a, a living in such ghetto with such harsh blockade, with such surveillance and, and digital securities and very intense uh, arm, technological army from air and uh, land and sea surrounding you. It's uh, it's not easy, I would say so. And. And also it's, uh, yeah, they, so they need to sustain themselves and uh, those many, many people around uh, the world have been supporting them, those who believe in them. And those are uh, many countries have been supporting them. And uh, through that, they, um, they has been actually very successful in sustaining who they are. That doesn't mean very successful as any you know, jihad have said. Also we had, they had time, they couldn't pay their people, but they were, for months, you know, and they came back again and could they could pay their people. So there was this kind of interventions of uh, negotiations between uh, Hamas and, and how, 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 th how, how the, the policy of, uh, of uh, how to deal with Hamas has been in place. And there was um, those who Israel has been involved in, uh, the, the, been, the, peop the countries that have been involved, Qatar in particular, on, on Turkey also, has been kind of in the middle on to uh, do any to do uh, to to be to speak on behalf of Hamas. So yeah, Hamas and Israel speaks and they are sustained. Did I get the, all the question or not? Yeah, I think you got most most so. of it at least. All right, we are running out of time, so I want to end with something a bit more uh, positive. And maybe since I think we all agree politics is not doing well, not in the West Bank, not in Gaza. So maybe we can talk about what other initiatives and both of you I know involved in all kinds of uh, initiatives in Gaza. Uh, Majid, you, you led some campaigns that I'm aware of there. Maybe you can tell us about what are people there doing on the ground in addition to those political, you know, Fatah Hamas, uh, Jabha, what are, what are local initiatives happening to make a change locally in, in Gaza specifically? I think there is, I would say there is a huge focus in storytelling at the moment and how to narrate Gaza by the Palestinians and how to lead and actually improve and empower the local agency of the people in the ground. Actually, the young people are more aware that the West have, will not save them and, uh, uh, and they are more aware and strongly kind of confident about their agency with the liberation of Palestine. So there is a there is very um, strong uh, generations that is bringing lots of hope to that not compromising hope actually it's very straightforward hope that is very normal with the, doesn't accept much of uh, compromises which is good so there is uh, for example me being involved in the we are not numbers which is uh, an organization that has been uh, recruiting many young people in gaza to uh, in the, like every year is to write stories for themselves. That is something very, I do think it's very important because we were, since me and Jihad were kind of the first people who've been writing and doing and 
uh, there at a certain point, but with a lots of Western journalists coming and doing many uh, writing and, and telling about Gaza, you know, having now many young many young people actually involved in writing and narrating what is actually happening in Gaza that is uh, very hopeful. The other, uh, I would say, one other thing that I see um, that there is uh, hope in the perspective of. Uh, perspective of that there is there is a unity um, between the people of Gaza and the people of Jerusalem and the people in the there is a kind of a, a unite after especially at the time since two three years there has been kind of a united people gathering despite the pyramids despite the checkpoint despite the walls people in all historic Palestine and outside of Palestine have been actually well connected so thank to digital uh, and so uh, digital media and social media that is uh, that this connection has been present thanks to Twitter and so on, it, despite the censorship that they brings to Palestinian narrative, but the still uh, Palestinians has uh, this connection that is bringing a lot of hope to getting to know each other, you know, and uh, by I do think Palestinian getting to know each other deeper and talking and having the challenge of coming together, I do think will bring much more a bit um, grounded future that uh, wherever, where, where the, Resolutions uh, and 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 like uh, the dismantling settler colonialism will be a uh, will be very much uh, a joint effort between all Palestinians with the uh, not measured. measured in addition to what you mentioned before we move to Jihad to his last comments about the scene, if there's one book you would recommend for people to read about Gaza or a website or an, something you think or or a documentary they should see if there's one thing. What would you want then? Well, the first thing that came to me also Jihad is part of it. There is an anthology that will come soon by the Quickers. I don't know, Jihad can speak about it a little bit more. And I actually know some people who have been written there. And I would say this is a great, this will be a great one. What and there's another- How do we find it? Uh, I think Jihad will uh, speak about it, you know? And the other thing you can visit with numbers and also read about some of the people there. But I also recommend to, uh, like to read Electric Intifada and 972 and and Mendo Ice and, and educate yourself. It's a long journey of knowledge, you know, and we are Palestinian and we're still figuring out how to politically analyze and bringing more clarity to what is the future should look like and what's the past was, uh, was what's our critique about the past and the present. So thank you so much, Aziz. Yeah. Thank you, Naj. Jihad. Uh, Thanks, Aziz. And uh, I wish you had more time to talk about the brilliant initiatives that Gaza's youth uh, are engaged in these days. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm a big fan because I'm a historian in training and I study and I write about history. I'm a big fan of a number of initiatives that are taking place in Gaza now, uh, where young people volunteer to uh, to re rebuild and renovate historic sites, uh, including uh, the uh, St. Hilarion Monast Monastery, which uh, was built around 325 AD, south of Gaza City. Uh, and I posted the link uh, about that site in the chat. And, um, and another example is an initiatives, which I talked about in a Twitter thread uh, by a local organization in my hometown in Deir el-Balah uh, that renovated an, an ancient uh, uh, tomb uh, and an and ancient Byzantine monastery, which is located in the middle of the town and turned it into a community center for children um, and they put in it a children's library and they provide psychosocial support for kids who suffer from PTSD and trauma. Um, so there are really beautiful initiatives taking place in Gaza. And one of the projects that, that uh, this uh, group in my hometown did recently, they went and they spoke to elderly women and collected all the folkloric songs that uh, that they they sing in different occasions, returning from pilgrimage and weddings, and you know, uh, and engagement parties, funerals, and so on and so. And they created an album based on uh, they, based on these songs. Uh, Gaza is rich. It's it's a really sophisticated place, full of 
things that will surprise you. It's beautiful. It's, uh, uh, you know, from, from the standpoint of uh, its cuisine, its culture as part of, you know, its location in the broader context of Palestinian culture, heritage and folklore. It's, it has so much to offer. And I really encourage the audience to uh, learn more about Gaza and to hopefully be able to visit Gaza soon when we are, you know, the Palestinians from Gaza are able to also go, which, you know, we are not capable of doing that. At the I, I get, I get uh, people asking me about that on tours. And unfortunately, the best we can do is have an overview and call someone sometimes from there, right. to talk to, which is not an ideal way to visit Gaza. Yeah. So oh, yeah, I mean, we have, we have, you know, uh, more than 50% of Gaza's population are children and young people. And, you know, those people try their best. I'm proud of my sister who uh, studies computer science and she, with six hours of electricity a day, she learned coding and she's now, you know, uh, she's, she's uh, moving from one coding uh, course to another, you know, speaking a language that I, <laughs> I personally won't be able to speak. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my mom, who's a lawyer, who's an activist. We, we have so many things to be proud of. And uh, I really like, I hope today's conversation was enriching. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to cover and answer all the questions. Uh, but that speaks to the fact that Palestinians rarely get to speak and Palestinians are rarely given the opportunity to reflect on the nuances of their political, cultural, economic life. So I'm, I'm personally very thankful for the opportunity to be here today. And I'm thankful for all the people who uh, attended and asked questions. And hopefully, you know, this isn't the last conversation we have. So thank you. And somebody suggested another documentary. I haven't seen it, so I don't know how good it is, but it's called Gaza 101 and Netflix. Haven't watched it, but if you guys want to watch it, let me know also how it was. I'll check it out. After, well, thank you everyone for joining us. We went five minutes over time. Sorry about that. And thank you for sticking with us. Thank you, Jihad and Majid for this conversation and I think uh, it's really really important to talk always to people from the place we're talking about and not just talk about those people with somebody else who've never been there never lived in those realities so thank you for being here for telling us about your life opening up about experiences you've gone through and giving us your analysis about uh, reality there and I hope this is just a start I know we couldn't answer every question this is just to get you maybe interested more in figuring out some of those questions and you can do your own research and you can attend more talks like this and you can ask more people those kind of questions. Uh, one thing about Palestinians, we do like to talk, so invite us and we're always, I think, willing to, to, to share. So thank you everyone again and uh, have a good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. What about these?